gentlemen of the College Historical Society, ladies and gentlemen, you are all very welcome to the HIST and the GMB. Um, many of you in the audience uh, are familiar with our Wednesday night debates, but for those of you who aren't, I would just like to put some context on uh, the event and the gold medal and what this means to the Society. Uh, spanning four centuries now, the HIST has tried to facilitate discourse through the medium of debate. Um, it holds at its very core uh, the ideals of free speech and intellectualism and a commitment to, to serious and respectful engagement with all ideas that are brought to the table. Um, it was at the meetings of this society that Wolf Town, the revolutionary Wolf Tone uh, articulated his vision for, for a free Ireland where Douglas Hyde addressed his, uh, his pride in the Irish language as an undergraduate and where the late Conor Cruz O'Brien uh, developed his skills in oratory. And there's a fundamental acknowledgement in this society that that enlightened discussion can only be brought about through discussion and engagement with all ideas, the, like the broadest spectrum of ideas in society. Um, and public discourse takes what the HIST does and it, it brings it to a mass audience. But, and although this heightens the capacity to, to, like, to change minds through discussion, it also can in some ways undermine uh, the, through the process um, and compromise the integrity of that spectrum of debate. Uh, not only has, has, has Noam Chomsky been crucial in bringing about argues, arguments and crucial dissent against the, against the mainstream narrative through his analysis of things such as American foreign policy, perhaps more importantly what he has done is he has brought about a fundamental awareness of, of, that, politi of that spectrum of discussion and transformed people's aware awareness of what p political and uh, public discourse in society really is today. What seems to drive Professor Chomsky's work is the belief and defence in that rudimental uh, democratic value of maintaining a check on power um, and its capacity for abuse. In a world focused on the, the merits of democracy, Professor Chomsky is perhaps one of the most important intellectuals al alive. He ranks with Marx, he ranks with Shakespeare and the Bible as the most quoted sources in the humanities. And it is with great privilege that I welcome him to the College Historical Society and to Trinity College to uh, and, and it is with honour that I present him with the, his gold medal for outstanding contribution to public discourse.
Gorbachev said that uh, the United States should uh, have a period of perestroika, sort of was off the topic. Uh, and Cole ended it up by uh, saying uh, only, yes, he agreed, it's really the people, not us, important as we were. And uh, but basically he said only heaven could have brought this miracle about. So that's who was responsible. Uh, that, uh, as soon as I read it, that, uh, and this is, there's a raft of such articles. In fact, the New York Times has an open competition for people to tell where they were, when it fell, how they reacted, and so on. Which is okay. This is a critically important event we should commemorate. Uh, the first thing that came to mind when I read it was uh, the uh, Grand Inquisitor chapter in uh, uh, Brothers Karamazo. If you recall the story, uh, it's in Seville at the height of the Inquisition, and uh, there's a tumult in the streets. Uh, turns out Jesus Christ had appeared. Uh, he was immediately picked up by the security forces and brought to the Grand Inquisitor, and the Grand Inquisitor explains to him why he's going to have to execute him, uh, because he has to put an end to the evil works of Christ, who's uh, just bringing misery to the masses by uh, trying to bring them freedom. <coughs> and the mass of people don't want freedom. It's going to make them miserable. They may think they want it, but they don't. But what they want is uh, worshipful obedience, complete submission to authority. And the Grand Inquisitor has the task of ensuring that they have complete admission, submission to authority. Uh, well, you know, it relates in some way to the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, but it relates even more closely to a non-event, an important non-event that took place about the same time as the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. In fact, uh, one week later, it was after uh, November 16th, uh, 1989. Uh, on November 16th, uh, what happened is that uh, the the story of the Grand Inquisitor was effectively reenacted in the real world. Uh, Christianity was brought to an end the second time. The first time was when Constantine uh, converted and turned the radical pacifist uh, religion, which people persecuted, into the religion of the Roman Empire. So the cross, which was the symbol of the suffering of the poor, became the symbol on the shield of the Roman Empire. <coughs> and from that point, Christianity pretty much shifted from the radical pacifist religion of the poor uh, to the uh, religion of the rich and powerful, uh, pretty much living up to the admonishment of the grand prisoner. People have to submit to absolute authority, and we're making them happiness by allowing them to do that, and we don't want them. Anyone comes with Christ's message, we're going to have to kill him. Well, uh, you know, encapsulating a lot of history and cutting off a lot of edges. Uh, in the early 60s, uh, there was an effort to revive the Christianity of the Gospels, uh, namely after Vatican II. Uh, it's called liberation theology, uh, uh, especially in South America, but elsewhere too. Uh, the bishops uh, understood. <coughs> Uh, what was called the preferential option for the poor. Uh, they, bishops and lay people, part of this was that lay people should participate directly. Uh, they went out to poor peasant communities, uh, set up what were called base communities where uh, poor people read the Gospels, thought about what it meant. Uh, it's a subversive doctrine, so you're not supposed to read it, really. Maybe read the words, but not think about them. Uh, and uh, uh, they were supposed to think about it and uh, turn it into uh, ways to act to uh, achieve their basic fundamental human rights. Well, the pre taking the preferential option for the poor is a grave sin, and they had to be punished. They had to be executed. There's no, the nearest thing to the Grand Inquisitor around, the, so actually there are two, the U.S. government and the Vatican. And they combined to put an end to the heresy, uh, the Vatican. And in this case, we don't have to ask whether heaven helped, because we know who helped. They're proud of it. Uh, if you take a look at the, uh, the website of the 
School of the Americas, famous School of the Americas, changed its name now and then because its past is too ugly. Uh, it's called, I think, Confession, but the equivalent of Confession. So you change the name, but it's the same School of the Americas which trains Latin American killers. Uh, one of their talking points, advertising points, is that the U.S. Army helped defeat liberation theology, which is quite true. The Vatican helped by picking out the dangerous radicals who were daring to preach the Gospels, and uh, uh, the U.S. Army helped by just killing them. Uh, that episode from the early 60s ended uh, on November 16, 1989. Uh, that's when the uh, judgment of the Grand Inquisitor was uh, applied, actually much more harshly than the Grand Inquisitor, because he actually permitted Jesus just to leave town. But uh, these two Grand Inquisitors didn't do that. On November 16th, uh, a, an elite unit of the uh, Salvadoran Army uh, armed and trained directed by the United States, uh, which had already killed tens of thousands of people, the usual victims, the peasants, uh, labor activists, and so on. Uh, they s s uh, murdered, uh, blew out the brains of six leading Latin American intellectuals, Jesuit priests in El Salvador, along with their uh, <coughs> housekeeper and their daughter, and as her daughter. So that was the massacre of November 16th. Uh, the reaction to that, and that essentially ended this episode, not in one day, but the symbolic end of this heresy of the, the effort to revive Christianity. Well, it uh, sounds like an important event, but there won't be any commemoration of it. Uh, in fact, any memory of it, I doubt if many of you even know about it. In the United States, probably nobody would. In fact, I have in my office <coughs> at MIT, uh, I have a painting given to me by a Jesuit priest, which is a symbolic representation of this event. And what preceded it uh, shows the angel of death, and right underneath the angel of death is uh, another, a, 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 a painting which is supposed to represent uh, Archbishop Romero. Who's, uh, he was murdered while well, reading Mass in 1980 by pretty much the same forces kind of over this hideous decade. Not only in El Salvador, it was worse in Guatemala, it was horrible in Nicaragua and so on. Hundreds of thousands of people killed uh, in substantial measure of war against the church uh, to punish them for the grievous sin. And so the Archbishop Romero was killed in 1980. Uh, he was killed, well, I'll finish with the picture. He's in one position, right below him are the faces, intended to be the representations of the faces of the six uh, Jesuit priests and their, uh, their uh, housekeeper and their daughter. Uh, I put it there just kind of like to remind myself of the real world when I come into work, but it's turned out to be an interesting Rorschach test. Who knows what it is? Well, it turns out from the United States, almost nobody knows what it is. From Europe, maybe 10%. Uh, from Latin America, uh, in the early years, everybody knew what it was. Now, fewer, because young people are also getting indoctrinated and diverted from the important events of the world to the events that serve power. Uh, so it's kind of an indication of the, the significance of this, uh, this event. Uh, well, what's some, uh, something else happened. Uh, couple, immediately after the murder of the Jesuit priests, putting an end to the, this murderous, brutal battle, which had gone on, it includes other events too, like the uh, overthrow of Allende, the neo-Nazi state instituted by the Kennedy administration in Brazil and the hideous uh, uh, the horrors of Argentina and a long series of things that followed from the early 60s uh, heresies. And this is essentially the end. Now we have a piece, a piece of the graveyard so everyone's happy. Uh, the, uh, uh, a, a few weeks after this, Václav Havel came to the United States. He was, uh, he's now the hero of the other event, the real event, the event that took place. Uh, he uh, gave a talk to a joint session of Congress, and he got uh, 
standing ovation, rousing applause, or when he praised the United States as the defenders of freedom. This is right after they had murdered six of his counterparts, uh, putting, finishing off the uh, brutal and murderous events that uh, had taken place in between. Uh, well, just imagine the situation's been reversed, and that gives you a sharp indication of what's an event and what's a non-event. The, uh, I suppose that uh, uh, Havel and half a dozen of his colleagues had been uh, murdered by a Russian train and Russian-led uh, uh, elite battalion that had already killed tens of thousands of Czechs, and that the same things were going on in Poland and Hungary and so on, you know, hundreds of thousands of people killed, uh, any imaginable form of independence crushed by violence. And imagine that after this, uh, uh, Father A. Korea, the rector of the, one of the people who was killed, the most distinguished Jesuit who was killed in El Salvador, whose name nobody knows, of course, uh, wrong side, not a bit. Uh, suppose that he had gone to Moscow and spoken to the Duma and had gotten a rousing ovation for uh, calling the uh, Russians the defenders of freedom. Uh, we'd know about it. In fact, we, we might not know about it because it might have led to a nuclear war. Uh, but it certainly would be a major event. I mean, ultimate in horror. How could this happen in a civilized world? Well, that's their crime. The difference between their crimes and our crimes. Uh, their crimes are horrendous <coughs> and a terror and so forth, our crimes disappear very quickly. Uh, they're gone, forget about them, they didn't happen, uh, wiped out of history. Uh, that's, uh, and we're right in the middle of it right now, on the 20th anniversary of these two historic events, the breakdown of Russian control over Eastern Europe and uh, the destruction of Christianity, uh, replaying Constantine living the words of the Grand Inquisitor, except more brutally. Uh, and we know which ones want to be commemorated and which ones want to be forgotten. It has been forgotten. In the United States, at least, as far as I know, there's only one uh, commemoration of, the, of this anniversary. It's uh, at the Catholic University in Boston, Boston College, where one of the surviving Jesuits, young Sabrina, uh, will in fact attend, we'll also be talking about it, and a couple of other people, and, you know, a small gathering of people, many fewer than this, uh, will be there uh, uh, remembering. <coughs> uh, but if there's a reference in the press, I'll be amazed. If anyone on the Harvard faculty knows what's going on, we'd be astonished. Maybe one or two people involved in you know, solidarity activities. Well, that is characteristic. Uh, it's not just the media, of course, they go wrong. It's the academic world, it's the intellectual culture. And it extends just about over everything. And I'll end with just uh, one illustration, which is so grotesque that it's hard to voice, but uh, it's also very recent. Uh, the New York Review of Books is perhaps the leading uh, left liberal, left liberal intellectual journal in, in the world, pretty close to it. Uh, they had an article by a, a well-known liberal commentator uh, three months ago in July uh, in which he was reviewing a book by a major American historian, a collection of essays, and he starts off the review by saying that he learned a great deal from this book. It was quite interesting. One of the things he learned is that when Columbus came to the Western Hemisphere, we no longer say he discovered politically correct. But when the encounter took place, <coughs> Columbus and the Western Hemisphere, uh, he found a hemisphere that was essentially empty, uh, from the steaming tropics to the uh, Arctic North. There were maybe a million people, uh, stragglers, uh, hunter-gatherers, uh, kind of wandering around in the wilderness. Uh, and then, of course, the continent got civilized and so on. Well, you know, it's been known for decades that the number of people was maybe 80 or 100 million, that there were major cities, major civilizations, that about the only difference 
between them and the Europeans was that they were much healthier. Uh, they were conquered by European savagery and European filth, which spread diseases. So they were much healthier, and uh, they didn't have the same weapons. So they were just sort of, uh, exterminated, essentially. Well, you know, that's a genocide denial with a vengeance. It puts Holocaust denial in the shade. Uh, this is the major, a major left liberal intellectual journal. I waited to see if there'd be a letter. No letter. A couple of months later, there was a, like a four-line correction saying, which was worse than the original. Okay, that's our crimes. Uh, and they're okay uh, because uh, uh, we carried them out in a, uh, first of all, thank you, but guide, guided by the will of providence. American history is highly providential. It's one of the diseases that picked up from England. So everything that's done is following the will of God. And the city on the hill, or the shining <coughs> city on the hill, as Reagan put it, uh, he said that would be the last, but this will be the last reference, uh, which refers to one of the first examples of what's called now a humanitarian intervention <coughs> in the arrival of the first British colonists in Massachusetts. Uh, the city on the hill was a, comes from a sermon uh, that justifies everything you do, even if it's a mistake for the city on the hill. Uh, the, uh, it was a sermon by John Winthrop in uh, uh, Massachusetts in 1630, uh, uh, praising our mission. Uh, the year before, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had gotten its charter from, from the King of England, and the charter was given uh, so that they could carry out the mission of uh, saving the uh, pagans from their miserable fate. And they established a great seal, <coughs> which you can find on the internet. It's simply hidden because it looks as good. But you can find it on the internet. The great seal of the Bay Colony of Massachusetts that shows an Indian with his spears held down, sign of peace. And out of his mouth is coming a scroll. And on the scroll it says, come over and help us. Uh, so that's what they were doing. They were coming over, over to help the native people answering their plea, what we call humanitarian intervention. Uh, and in the process, they happened to exterminate them. But as was pointed out by the um, scholars, preachers, judges, and so on, <coughs> providence has strange ways. Uh, somehow they faded away uh, as the superior race uh, entered. There's nothing we could do about it. That's the way history is uh, recorded and accepted. It's what uh, people are taught in colleges, uh, internalized, uh, write about, present to the next generation. And it leads to uh, events and non-events, memorable ones and forgotten ones, all important, but they're crucially distinguished by a very <coughs> sharp criteria, which is hard to miss. Now I'm going to ask Noam to tell you a very good story which I stopped him telling at lunch today. Um, he thinks it might be true and it's about George W. Bush and the prophet Ezekiel. And I stopped him telling it because I was sure it would be worthy of a wider audience. I haven't heard it, but I'm going to now. Well, actually, I learned this story about five years ago and I couldn't believe it, so I never published it. But it's since been verified. So it's true. It's, uh, here's the story. I, I received uh, a letter and an article from a well-known Belgian theologian. Uh, the article was a learned dissertation on a very obscure passage in Ezekiel, which nobody understands. It's the passage about Gog and Magog uh, coming from the north and uh, leads up to Armageddon and so on and so forth. I mean, nobody knows whether Gog and Magog are people or places or you know, some other thing, or whatever they may be. Uh, so the prophet, the, the, the passage is extremely obscure, but it enters into evangelical Christian theology. Uh, Gog and Magog are whoever your current enemies are. 
So when Reagan talked about these things, Gog and Magog were the Russians, and they were coming down to do all kind of horrible things. Uh, now, Gog and Magog are, at that time, this is January 2003, it was the first Saddam Hussein, and he was presumably coming down to attack Israel, leave to Armageddon, the souls that have been saved rise to heaven, uh, everyone else dies. The Christian evangelical tradition of which this is a part is very strongly pro-Israel. They're one of the main pro-Israel blocks, but they are also the most anti-Semitic element in the world. Uh, they're in history, probably. Their picture is all the Jews will be killed. I mean, unless they happen to convert in time. Uh, can't get more anti-Semitic than that. Anyhow, Bush was meeting with uh, Jacques Chirac, the president of uh, France. He was trying to convince Chirac to uh, uh, join in on the war against Iraq. Fortunately, he didn't have that problem in 10 Downing Street. He didn't have to quote Ezekiel. But uh, uh, in the course of the discussion with Chirac, he started going on about this uh, you know, Gog and Magog and Ezekiel and so on, and Chirac had not a clue what he was talking about. So he approached the Elysee, the foreign office, asking him, can you explain to me what this maniac is raving about? And they didn't know. So they uh, approached this Belgian theologian who explained to them what it was all about. Well, you know, that's what we've survived. It's kind of amazing that we're all, all alive. But we've survived uh, a world in which the finger on the button that can destroy us all in five seconds uh, is uh, you know, often some world where Gog and Magog are coming around. <laughs> and it was the same with Reagan. In fact, it, been the same for the last few years. And for years, the, a large part of the fate of the world has been in the hands of the one lunatic who's waiting for the second coming, and Armageddon and so on, and another one who's uh, waiting for the 12th Imam, who's about to well, you know, human survival. If somebody was watching this on Mars, they would think that human survival is a miracle. There's no way it can continue like this, and chances are it can't. Since we're talking about God, we must move to Downing Street. Um, Tony Blair um, obviously has a special relationship with God. <laughs> God, it appears, does not give him any advice. And he didn't say, you know, Tony, this Iraq thing may not be such a good idea. Um, I wonder if you could tell us um, why statesmen either want to be close to God or why they want to be Winston Churchill and Roosevelt. There seems to be a World War II fascination with these people. Um, you don't have to explain Tony Blair to us, but I'd like that as well. I can try. Well, you know, it, there's a lot about Winston Churchill that is pretty hairy, so I'm sure you know more about it than I do. But uh, The Irish do, too. The I Irish, Irish, <laughs> Irish have heard of him, too. Uh, for example, just to give one example, he was sometimes refreshingly honest. So back right before the First World War, he gave a speech in, uh, in the Parliament, uh, which he later published, but editing out all the uh, interesting parts that later discovered in the paper somewhere. And in it, he explains uh, why uh, we have to rule the world. He says, we've gained control of vast amounts of territory by violence and terror and uh, robbery and now it's ours, and we've got to maintain it, and uh, we have a right to protect it. And he went on later in his history of the Second World War to say that uh, we are like rich men living in their ample habitations who just want to be left in peace. So leave us alone, really the world, don't bother us. He then went on in 1944 to order the army, uh, to the army command to uh, developed a plan which he called on them to implement in May 1944, they wouldn't do it. It was called Operation Unthinkable. Uh, Operation Unthinkable was a plan to, you, uh, he wanted them not to destroy too much of Germany because we'd need them, uh, to employ the Wehrmacht and the RAF and the American forces to attack and destroy Russia. This is 1944 when the Russians are fighting the 
overwhelming bulk of the war against the Nazis. And Churchill was planning an operation to destroy them using the German army. Uh, well, that's been pretty well hidden. It was finally declassified a couple of years ago, but I don't know if it's been reported anywhere, but you, f you find it in histories of British intelligence. So he's an interesting character, a lot of, lot of interesting things. I'm sure you can add plenty more. Uh, so why do people either uh, want to be close to God or close to Roosevelt and Churchill? Well, Roosevelt and Churchill, easy. They won, and you want to be close to the people who win. Maybe you can win. And the owner was hit by and the enemy was Hitler and uh, Saddam and uh, Hirohito and so on. I um, don't to say about that, but Hitler certainly, the Japanese was a more complicated story. But why to be close to God? Well, you know, that's a, uh, that's a British-American perversion. It goes back very far. Uh, it goes back to England, which was a providentialist culture. You know, God guides us and tells us what to do. In the United States, the colonists who came over from England were mostly religious fanatics. They were kind of extremist religious elements, and they carried with them the providentialist streak in uh, British culture. And it lasted right, it lasts right to the present, like George Bush, you know, same thing. We're fulfilling God's will. Now, God has strange ways, so sometimes it turns out that the uh, the native population fades away before our glory, uh, but it, uh, it's, uh, we're still fulfilling God's will, and since we're the shining city on the hill, how can we go wrong, even if we occasionally make mistakes? So it's really good to be close to God. It justifies everything you do. Uh, this was combined in the United States with another British lunacy, the uh, Anglo-Saxon racism revival which took place around the Reformation. You know, we're pure <coughs> Saxons, uh, kind of, uh, it, it goes back to a book of Tacitus, Germania, you know, in which he describes how the Aryan race developed uh, somewhere around near where Iran is, and they were a new species, you know, tall, blonde, big, big brains, uh, courageous, intelligent, you know, just a, totally new species, uh, they, uh, migrated, they migrated to the German forests. There they became Teutons. Uh, they then migrated farther west, and they conquered the British Isles. Uh, and then they, in the later version, they migrated across the Atlantic, and be they became the Americans. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, for example, is a great believer in this. Uh, some of them made a mistake. Some of the Aryans intermarried with the populations they conquered, and that led to racial degeneration, so you get the Mediterranean cultures, which are sort of dirty and inefficient and so on and so forth. But the pure Aryans uh, never intermarried. They just exterminated everybody. Uh, so they, they kept Anglo-Saxon purity. That's why Britain was so, such a fantastic place to conquer the world. And then right through the 19th century, uh, in, in the United States, the Anglo-Saxon mythology uh, was very widespread. Uh, it, when the U.S. conquered the Philippines, uh, General MacArthur, the father, Arthur MacArthur, who was the in charge of it, uh, talked to Congress. This is about a century ago, early 20th century. He explained to Congress uh, this was at a time <coughs> when they conquered the Philippines. They killed about a couple hundred thousand people. That was, again, in order to civilize them and uplift them, you know, lots of worthy objectives. And he explained to Congress uh, that uh, we had to do this because we're following the will of God and because we're, we are the Anglo-Saxon race, the pure Anglo-Saxon race, and we have to follow the tradition from uh, the German forests uh, on through England and ourselves to uh, benefit the rest of the people of the world by exterminating them. Uh, they'll be happier when they're exterminated and the Anglo-Saxon race takes over. And this is all God's will, because we're following the will of providence. It's kind of, it's kind of unbeatable. So yeah, it's a, it's a good line. Let's follow the God bit, <clears throat> democracy. Um, in 2006, the Palestinians had a fair election and were stupid enough to elect the wrong people, Hamas, and they're still being punished for it. 
um, were punished then and are being punished now. Uh, then in June, uh, which I had the dubious pleasure of witnessing, um, Ahmadinejad was elected by an uh, impossibly high vote as president of um, Iran. Um, when I was asked to ask him a question immediately afterwards, I called him Mr. Ahmadinejad Sir, which was my slimy way of avoiding calling him President Ahmadinejad. But nonetheless, after lots of sort of sulking, we kind of accepted it. Then we have the elections in Afghanistan, uh, of which were obviously fraudulent, and um, the Americans insisted on a runoff because they didn't believe Karzai was necessarily a legitimate president. Then his opponent refused to participate in the runoff, which would, of course, cost a lot of Western lives. We don't care about the Afghan ones. And then yesterday, we learned that the uh, election tribunal, which is run by one of Karzai's uh, parachiks, said that he is now the president, there won't be a runoff. And he got the congratulations of Gordon Brown and your president, Obama, who had earlier said that this was a complete fraud. So they're now congratulating an utterly fraudulently elected president and presumably going to send the 40,000 members of the US cavalry quite soon to help. Can you unravel this for me and for us, no? The one thing about it that's puzzling is that Gordon Brown came first. I he thought he would, he would wait for Obama to do it, like Blair would have. He's a stallion on the leash. <laughs> but, but other than that, it's, it's like so normal that you can't even say anything. In fact, it's even recognized by scholarship. So democracy promotion is one of those slogans that everyone's in favor of. Actually, we have now a lot of Russian archives. When the communist apparatchiks decided to become a third world elite back in 1990, uh, one of the things they did is sell everything off, including the archives. Uh, so there's now a lot of archives, and there's a whole scholarly industry called Cold War history, which is pouring over the archives to see if they can find something that will justify what the U.S. did during the Cold War. It's not turning out so easy. Uh, but uh, some of the stuff in the archives is interesting, and it's about this. I mean, you have these gangsters talking to each other internally, you know, not for public, uh, any public ears, you know, Gromyko, Molotov, all of them. And they're talking very sincerely about the need to protect democracy in Eastern Europe from the fascist attack led by the United States, which is trying to undermine it. And I'm sure it's perfectly sincere, you know, no indication that the KGB is listening. That's what they believe. And it's the same that you hear uh, Western diplomats talk about their uh, uh, dedication to democracy promotion. Now, this has been studied. Uh, the best scholarly study of this, if you want to look at it, is by uh, Thomas Carruthers, who incidentally is a neo-Reaganite. He's very much in favor of democracy promotion. He thinks it's a wonderful thing. He writes both from the inside uh, he was in the Reagan State Department working on democracy promotion uh, uh, you know, objectives. And as a scholar, well, he's a careful scholar. He was head of the uh, Carnegie Endowment on Law and Democracy or something when he was writing this, these things. He wrote several books on the history of democracy promotion. They're going way back, right through the Reagan years. Uh, during the Reagan years, what he knew from the inside, uh, where his fervent commitment to democracy promotion uh, he points out that democ there was, in fact, progress towards democracy. This is about Latin America. There's progress towards democracy in Latin America, namely in the South, where the U.S. had very little influence. And he said the Reagan administration tried to prevent it, but they couldn't. And nevertheless, there was progress for democracy. In the surrounding region, where the U.S. had much more power and influence, he said there was no progress toward democracy, in fact, the opposite. Uh, because, and he says, because the US would support only particular forms of democracy that left in power traditional elites that would be, act in conformity with US interests. So that's kind of a paradox about the Reagan administration. But then he extends it. He said the paradox extends to all administrations. He said in every administration, the United States supports democracy if and only if it conforms to strategic and economic objectives. It's 
and he says all leaders are somehow schizophrenic. You know, they need psychiatric care. They don't see that there's something strange about their uh, the puzzle of their supporting democracy. Let me think of another reason, but uh, that's his conclusion. But he does record the facts correctly. It goes right through the second Bush administration. And uh, yeah, it's a great surprise to anybody who's purposely blind about uh, history and policy for me. <coughs> it's one of those puzzles, like the uh, fading away of the indigenous population when we came to save and uh, Christianize them. Well, history is full of such puzzles. Last question, too. Now, I'm preceded by a memory of mine. When I first went to Israel in 1976, I thought it was a very European sort of country, good phone system, nice food, democracy, parliament, everything. When I go there now and see the settlements and the wall, not a security fence, please, a wall, um, I wonder if it will survive. And it was a Jewish friend of mine in California when I was about to give a talk some months ago who we were looking at the wall of the um, hall where I was to speak. And, um, Jewish philanthropists are extremely generous in the United States, and of course most of the names on the wall were Jewish. And I said to... Uh, Jeffrey, my friend, I said, you know, do you think, what would you think, if you were an Israeli, would you live there or would you live here? And he said, I think, Robert, this might be Israel. And that place to the south of Lebanon where you live is a small colonial project which may or may not work. And I recall how I used to think when I first went to Yugoslavia, long before the war, I believed in Yugoslavia. The Yugoslavs did not, as we later discovered. Will Israel survive? No? This, um, there always was a dark side, even in the days when it was a very attractive place. I mean, I, I lived there in the early 50s, you know, I often thought about going back uh, as late as maybe 15, 20 years, 20 years ago. I <coughs> considered my wife and I that, you know, if we had to leave the United States for some reason, we'd probably go there. But now I think I'd prefer to come to Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, and it changed. I mean, there was a dark side, very dark side. I mean, it's a settler colonial society. A settler colonialism is the absolute worst form of imperialism uh, because you have to act like the Aryans and the Teutons and the, and the myth that's our Anglo-Saxon origin. You have to exterminate the natives or get rid of them or something. That's a part of settler colonialism. So it was absolutely the worst kind of You are telling us the history of Ireland at the moment as well. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> you can add your own <laughs> piece to it. And so, of course, Israel was the same. You know, a lot of ugly things. But it's true that the part of the society that we would run into, that I would see, that you would see, was a very civilized, uh, you know, West westernized society in the best sense. Uh, it was like a... Scandinavian social democracy. And that's changed. Now it's very much like the United States. It has very high inequality. Uh, the social system has collapsed. Uh, a lot of wealth. A, a very advanced high-tech economy with tremendous amounts of poverty. And that's even excluding the settlers and the wall, which is just an annexation wall and uh, all the other horrors there. So will it survive? My feeling, actually, I wrote about this shortly after the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, that the worst enemies of Israel were those who were supporting it. What they're in fact supporting is Israel's moral degeneration and ultimate destruction. And I increasingly think that that's true. In fact, you could see it very quickly. So in 1971, uh, President Sadat of Egypt offered Israel a full peace treaty uh, in return for withdrawal from occupied territory. Now, he didn't care one way or another about the West Bank and Golan Heights. Uh, what he cared about was Egyptian territory. So in return for withdrawal from Egyptian territory, they could have had full peace. Well, you know, peace with Egypt means major security problems are over. Uh, that's the only meaningful military force in the region. So there was nothing for the Palestinians in this, incidentally. It's the early 70s. Palestinians weren't an issue. So nothing for the Palestinians, full peace, in return for withdrawal from the Sinai. Well, at the time, 
Israel was carrying out substantial, they were planning substantial settlement programs in the Northeast Sinai, uh, which they were driving out tens of thousands of Bedouin farmers, driving them into the desert, uh, uh, destroying towns, you know, mosques, uh, graveyards, everything. They were putting up uh, a lot of settlements in one big city. They were planning a city, a meet a million people uh, on the seacoast. That was the civilized period. Uh, and they had a choice at that point, a very clear choice. Do we choose security or expansion? Okay. They chose expansion. They rejected the offer. Now the critical question, as always, is what's the boss going to say? The boss in Washington. Uh, what he says goes. Uh, and there was a state internal to the US government. We don't know all the details yet because it hasn't fully declassified, but there's enough to figure out what happened. There was a conflict between the Secretary of State, William Rogers, and the National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger. Uh, Kissinger had, his primary enemy in the world was William Rogers, because the sect way down somewhere was the Russians. Uh, the reason was he wanted to become Secretary of State, in which case he would run everything, you know, not have divided authority. So if Roger said it's raining, Kissinger would tell Nixon the sun is shining, you know, the, the way the bureaucratic battle went. Well, Rogers was in favor of accepting Sadat's proposal. In fact, it was pretty close to his own proposals. So Kissinger had to be against it. And Kissinger had a policy which he called stalemate. No negotiations, just forced. So he, he succeeded in winning the bureaucratic battle. He soon became Secretary of State. Rogers disappeared. He backed Israel's rejection of, uh, of Sadat's offer. That led directly to the 1973 war. Uh, Sadat kept saying repeatedly, you know, if, if you're going to build the Amid, it's going to be war. And Israel and the United States just laughed. You know, Arabs don't know how to, which end of the gun to hold. That kind of thing. Very racist theory. <coughs> okay, 1973 war came along was a very close thing for Israel. You know, they were on the verge of destruction, literally. Uh, Moshe Dayan was ready to commit suicide. Uh, they apparently loaded their nuclear weapons. Uh, Kissinger called a nuclear alert, and you know, the whole world came close to destruction. Well, you know, they managed to carry it off at the end. And if there's one thing Kissinger understands, it's force. Maybe that's why he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, so he recognized you can't just write off Egypt as a basket case. Uh, then comes the uh, reconstruction of history that academics and the media are responsible for. What followed after that was what was called shuttle diplomacy. You know, Kissinger, the grand diplomat, is flying up and back everywhere, you know, getting people to talk to each other, carrying out a noble mission. Uh, and finally, in 1978, uh, uh, Mrs. Carter now, uh, they, Israel, the United States, and Egypt made an agreement, the Camp David Agreement, which, which essentially accepted Sadat's 1971 offer. Now that goes down in history as a great diplomatic triumph. Uh, Kissinger gets the Nobel Prize, uh, Carter gets the Nobel Prize, and it's wonderful. In fact, it was a diplomatic catastrophe. I mean, what happened is that they rejected, in 1971, the offer, uh, uh, which could have ended the conflict, and in 1978 and 79, they were forced to accept it uh, after a major war, you know, terrible potential, could have been much, even much worse, uh, a lot of suffering, a lot of bloodshed, but they finally accepted it. Okay, diplomatic triumph. Uh, that's, uh, you know, and since then, it's just been downhill. You cannot carry out a military occupation, becoming occupiers, and maintain your elementary moral values. You can't be robbing people, killing them, stealing their land, stealing their resources, without being becoming racist. I mean, if you're crushing somebody, you've got to have a justification. And the just, only justification can be their evil nature. That's kind of universal, right through the history of imperialism and conquest. Their evil nature. Uh, you know this way better than I do, but like after the Irish famine, uh, British uh, you know, historian uh, leading figures were coming here and uh, uh, saying, of course, the 
famine has nothing to do with us, it's the evil nature of the Irish. I remember one English historian, I forget his name, uh, described how awful it was here after the famine, which of course the Irish were responsible for, and he said, when you get to Ireland, what you see is uh, human chimpanzees, but of course we see that all over the world, in Africa, and Southeast Asia, and everywhere else. But what's particularly awful about it in Ireland is that the human chimpanzees have white faces. Well, that's no good. They're supposed to have black faces or brown faces or something. But it's their fault, you know. And everything we do is their fault. Uh, it's another historical universal, and another one is that there's a category of people called intellectuals. They're supposed to make make this look good. That's an I think we'd better have some serious questions now from the floor. Um, just a few, but anyone want to ask a question of Professor Chomsky? There's a gentleman over there. Speak up. I don't hear uh, I'm telling you, it's okay. Political debate in the United States seems to be very detached from reality, especially things like Fox News. Why do you think that is? Same reason it is everywhere. Do you know a place where political debate isn't detached from reality? Uh, and in fact, there's a kind of a correlation. The more powerful a country is, the more detached, the more crimes it's committing. It's almost automatic and hence the more detached from reality discussion has to be. I mean, if you're, uh, you know, some small country somewhere, say Ireland, uh, you don't happen to be committing massive crimes at the moment outside. Uh, so yeah, you can be a little closer to reality. There's less to conceal. There's less to delude people about. Actually, I, Bob corrected me the other day in a column in the Independent by a phrase, manufacturing consent, which I in fact had plagiarized. And he says the wrong notion. It should be manufacturing uh, deceit. I should add that the, the column began with the words, Professor Chomsky is right, and it ended with the words, Professor Chomsky was wrong, which is why he's bringing it up now. Carry on. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, lady over here? Just speak up and I'll... beginning in the 60s, but kind of went on from there, and it just repeats earlier patterns. It just became engaged, active, involved, and it changed things. So the activism of the 60s began in part as a reaction to disillusionment with John F. Kennedy. If Kennedy came in with the same kind of charisma, you know, PR, and so on, that Obama did, and of course people were disillusioned, never had a, any intention of doing anything decent. Uh, and instead of giving up, they became, they started becoming active. So the civil rights movement, which of course had always been there at some level, uh, really took off in the early 60s. It was mostly students. It began with uh, black students and uh, black colleges in the South, elite black colleges in Atlanta, uh, sitting at lunch counters, uh, you know, later riding freedom buses, uh, they were joined by young people in the North. Uh, pretty soon it was a mass movement. It compelled Kennedy to back off and uh, support 
to his verbal support for the Civil Rights Movement, uh, which then led Johnson, the ex-president, to pass uh, non-trivial legislation, uh, legislation which gave the blacks the f at least the formal right to participate in society for the first time. Formal right, I emphasize, because other things didn't change much. Uh, but uh, that was a big step. Okay, that led to the, that was a major factor that led to the anti-war movement, which kind of took off from there. There were other strains. And uh, four or five years after the Kennedy started the war, uh, there was a substantial anti-war movement. And it was significant. And it continues. There's much more opposition to aggression today than there was, say, in the midst, at any comparable stage of the Vietnam War. That's one reason why uh, Bush it couldn't use the tactics in, in Iraq, could not use the tactics that were freely available to John F. Kennedy. Uh, no saturation bombing, no chemical warfare, you know, horrible enough, but uh, could have been a lot worse. It was a constraint. You know. uh, in the 70s, uh, the feminist movement took off. But, but I, I mean, again, it was always there. You know, it was there for centuries. Uh, but it really took off in the 1970s, an outgrowth of the uh, the activism of the 60s, including some quite interesting things if you look at the internal dynamics. So the, the leading edge of the anti-war movement in the 60s was the resistance. These were young men, mostly, who were taking serious risks. It's not fun when you're 18 to say, okay, I'll go to jail for five years, or I'll leave the country and never come back. And that's what they were doing. And they wanted to feel morally upright about it. But if you look at the inner workings of the resistance, I was right in the middle of it, so you could see it. It had the standard sexist assumptions of the time. Uh, the women, young women, did all the shit work, and the men were out being grand and giving speeches. And uh, women started to protest. You know, and that led to a lot of, kind of moral uh, concern. In fact, it even led to suicide. But it was a, because you know, how can we be brave and upright and moral while at the same time we're doing this? And uh, it was one of the strains that led to the youth element in the feminist movement of the 60s, 70s, which just expanded all over the place. So like say my own university, MIT, if you walk down the hall in 1960, it was uh, white males, 100%. Uh, well-dressed, ties and jackets, uh, deferential, you know, polite, and so on. But you walk down the halls today, it looks like this. Uh, and, and that's a big change. It's a change that, that reflects the society becoming more civilized. And uh, you know, later you get things like the International Solidarity Movement, which is unique in the history of imperialism, never been able to like it, uh, the justice movement, uh, all sorts of things. Well, that's progress. And why should it stop? You know, should go on and can. Just one more question. Um, General with the spectacles. Uh, yeah, you. That's it. Yep. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like a lot of the talk things that you talk about, is, it, it brings, it really brings, you know, to bear, you know, the the crimes that are carried out by America and so on, and 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 the and how they're ignored. And also, you talk a lot about. You, Say in some cases where we really have to focus on, you know, what's responsible. So what the American government is responsible, what mm -hmm. America has to do, what America, the American government is responsible, rather than China or something. But on the other hand, it's I mean, for all that we can talk about how terrible capitalism is or how terrible Iraq is, it's hard to get away from those particularly serious areas like, um, like that for or around over the Congo or something, where. So can you come to the question? Yeah, so we're running out a bit of time, yeah. Where, where, where the main crime seems to be apathy or something. So, I'm, but, uh, so what, is, is there any possibility for humanitarian intervention that doesn't have a material motive or that, that doesn't have terrible consequences? Yeah. Or what, I don't, don't know okay. Is there any chance of humanitarian intervention which doesn't have an ulterior motive? I think that's basically the question. It's conceivable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you look at a major scholarly history of uh, uh, humanitarian intervention uh, between 
the, the, the Kellogg Briand Pact in 1928, which outlawed war and uh, 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 some recent period, I forget what it is. And the a scholar, a serious scholar, found three examples of humanitarian intervention. Uh, Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, uh, uh, Japan's invasion of Manchuria, and uh, Hitler's <coughs> takeover of uh, the Sudetenland. Now, he didn't mean that they were real humanitarian intervention. Uh, what he meant is those are the three cases where a strong case was made that it's humanitarian. And that's pretty typical. I mean, there are other studies that go way back. Uh, sometimes they find one example of the French intervention in Syria in 1860 or something. But then if you look at the details, it's just part of France is trying to establish its power. Uh, maybe the, the British intervention in Sierra Leone would pass the filters. I don't know. I haven't looked at it carefully. But yeah, it's conceivable. But, you know, it's a little bit like uh, Gandhi's alleged uh, answer to the question, what do you think about Western civilization? And he's supposed to have said, well, it might be a good idea. <laughs> Same with humanitarian intervention. Yeah, it might be a good idea. Now, if I caught what you were saying, you mentioned the Congo. See, that, that's a kind of interesting case. Uh, the Congo is absolutely the worst catastrophe going on anywhere, and has been for years. Uh, no talk of intervention, or even anything. Uh, Darfur is a huge issue in the United States. It's here, Save Darfur committees. Uh, that's pretty awful, you know, no doubt. But it isn't a fraction of what's going on in the Congo. So why, uh, of course, nobody talks about doing anything, just let's shriek about it. Uh, the, uh, so why Darfur and not the Congo? Well, you know, it's not hard to figure it out. Uh, in Darfur, you can blame it on enemies, uh, the Arabs, you know, the enemies. So they're doing it. So it's terrible. Uh, if you look at the Congo, it's a little harder. For one thing, the worst atrocities are carrying out by Rwanda, which is Washington's closest ally. Uh, so that parts out. Uh, the other thing is that the multinational corporations are all over eastern Congo where the fighting is going on. <coughs> and they're using the militias who are slaughtering everybody uh, to gain control over the rich resources of the eastern Congo. And you should all be applauding, at least all of you who have cell phones, because that's where the coal pan comes from. And the same with much else. So, you know, talking, making a big fuss about uh, eastern Congo is kind of difficult. It's a little bit like this uh, January 2006 election and uh, uh, free election in Palestine, I guess the only free election in the Arab world. It's not nice to talk about that while we're prating about democracy promotion since we, U.S., instantly moved in to punish the population, partially for voting the wrong way. And Europe, as usual, kind of toddled along polite. So we don't talk about that one. And the same with the Congo. I think I'll end with a tiny historical anecdote that um, <coughs> Professor Chomsky may not know. He referred to the French involvement in Syria, which of course was the uh, civil war between Christians and Druze in Lebanon. Uh, it was called the Anti-Lebanon and then the Lebanon Federation. Um, but in fact, the French went in to protect the Christians. The British arrived on warships, which they uh, moored in uh, Sidon, and went to defend the Druze. And they said that if the Druze would accept British protection, they would have a particularly unique offer for Druze tribal leader, leaders. And that is that the British would arrange for their sons to go to English public schools. <laughs> On that note, I think I'd better thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'd like to wrap up by um, once again uh, thanking the guests for coming. They, Professor Chomsky and Robert Fisk have taken the time out of their schedule uh, free of charge. They don't charge anyone for doing this. Um, that's why we're able to do what we do. Um, so on behalf of the committee and the College of Arts Society, I'd just like to once again thank you, the guests, for taking your time.
Um, I don't think we really have time today. Um, I just want to give a rundown of what the a few what, what events will be happening over the next few days. Um, tomorrow, as always, the HIS will be having its Wednesday night debate. Um, it was touched on today in the in the interview um, that this house would negotiate with Hamas, so it will kind of address the legitimacy of Hamas as a political organisation. On Thursday night, uh, Robert Fisk, who is another gold medalist of the society, um, and gave an address last year, which was phenomenal. If you want to get another taste of that, that will be on Thursday at half seven. He'll be being interviewed by John Bowman. Um, if you want to get tickets, they're available on seminars.ie, or as I think you can get them at the National Concert Hall when you go there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm pretty certain from having read the website that there is a student price available, so it's quite affordable. Um, if you'd like to get involved, uh, there, there are plenty of ways to get involved with the HIST. Uh, first of all, there's the RNL committee, so if you want to kind of do the things that we do and get to have dinner with guests and stuff like that, just email censor at the hist .com. Um, Always check out our Facebook page. Uh, you don't need to be on Facebook to check it, but it's always got information about the events that we're doing. Um, and then finally, our next week's debate, uh, the week after that, will be a student show debate on the motion Dulce et decorum est pro patri uh, mori. So with that, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming along.